Welcome everyone to the third in our webinar series on approaches that work, pain and dementia. And uh, today I'm very, very pleased uh, to uh, share with you uh, Ravindra Amin, who is a, um, the Chief of Psychiatry at Kohler Rehabilitation and Nursing Care Facility, which is part of uh, New York City uh, Health Plus Hospital. And uh, he's also the Associate Professor of Psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine, who will be talking about principles of pharmacological management. And after him, we will hear from Mary Beth Gallagher. So without further ado, Dr. Amin, do you care to get, get us started? Thank you, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, I must say this, when you want to learn, somehow good teachers just keep happening along your way. The very first speaker we had in this series, Dr. Diane Meyer, I'm so happy to say that she was one of my teachers when I was in my fellowship training as a geriatric psychiatrist at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And also so wonderful to see that Mary Beth, the co-speaker with me, has been one of the teachers along the way as well, and Tina Alonso. I'll mention their work and their, their contributions to my learning along the way as I teach, and thank you for this opportunity. My focus today is to continue our focus on the importance of attention to recognizing pain and its multimodal management approach is the most important thing. I would focus on key principles of pharmacological management. The aspect of uh, medications is very vast. So what I would hope to do is stay focused on the key principles. And if we have more time, we can go into more Q&A. These are our uh, collaborators at Kohler, Deepa Vinu, who has championed dementia care here at our, our place, Kohler. Dr. Bina Philip George has been a palliative care medicine champion and Howard Finger is uh, an ethicist. And we sure have received a lot of attention from Comfort Matters, Caring Kind and Music and Memory. We're so grateful for that. I hope to uh, uh, address these issues, key principles of pharmacological treatments, types of pain and basic information about pharmacological options as we heard in the first talk during this series, pain is under-recognized and under-treated in hospitalized and nursing home residing persons with dementia. I cannot emphasize that more about it. This is clearly out there in the literature. And I imagine the same applies to community residing people with dementia just as well. Pain just does not get seen. Often pain behaviors may be uh, inappropriately addressed by psychotropic medications in absence of recognizing pain and treating pain. This is our experience at Kohler. More than 800 bed facility in 2011, the green line is Kohler's data. Almost 38% of our residents received an antipsychotic medication, let alone all other psychotropic medications. The orange bar, which is a national benchmark in 2011, it is embarrassed to say that even nationwide, 25% of nursing home residing residents received an antipsychotic medication. Thankfully, both the curves have decreased but with good attention to psychotropic management, our green bar, which came down so substantially and has consistently remained very low, most recent data is we actually hover around 5% of the residents who receive antipsychotic medications, whereas the national benchmark still hovers more close to 12, 14%. Now, what about pain? All this journey while we managed to traverse reducing psychotropic medication, how much did we understand pain? Here is a rather poignant story. Several years ago, about five years ago, a 72 year old male got admitted to Kohler from a psychiatric inpatient unit. 
who had a history of he was hemiplegia and vascular dementia. He did not have language function. He mostly sat screaming extremely loudly. He would hit himself on the head incessantly so hard that the staff put mittens on his hands in order to prevent him from injuring himself. However, his behavior continued. He came to us with high doses of antipsychotic medications and mood stabilizers. His behavior continued anyway, even as we saw uselessness of the psychotropic medications and we removed it, not much happened. We debated whether he should take pain medications and our team often discussed that yes, he has pain, but we were not very comfortable with which medication to use, how much to use until we got some extra help. That extra help came from Comfort Matters. In 2018, we got a training and accreditation grant to have Comfort Matters come with us. And here's what we got in 2017. How many of our residents were actually receiving pain medications on our memory care units? Of about approximately 100 residents, less than 2% received any standing doses of pain medications. Thanks to Comfort Matters, Tina Alonso came and sat with us to discuss that resident that I just mentioned, who was so much in pain and anguish, if we scored him on appropriate pain rating scale, everyone could recognize that pain scored very high, but we did not know what to do with it. Tina Alonso from Comfort Matter comes along. I'm so sorry. She sat with us. She got the whole team together. Such an important thing. We realized, get your whole team together. It takes, as I thought, a whole village of your community to really recognize and set a new tone for a culturally putting pain as the centerpiece of understanding and caring for comfort in people with dementia. Now, just this is the data as of yesterday, at the bottom line, 30% of our 120 residents on memory care unit receive a standing dose of acetaminophen, one of them on a diclofenac topical cream. Four people, 3%, receive standing dose of an opioid. This is when less than two years ago, we were terrified at the thought of considering an opioid medication for somebody who has a diagnosis of dementia. This is where we are, and it is still a journey ongoing. We hope to keep up with this work. Key principles of pain, recognize when the pain is present. We just didn't recognize it. And we often treated residents with psychotropic medications. Pain ad is our preferred tool to recognize pain. And here was a wonderful experience that I had with Mary Beth, who is going to talk next. I was absolutely delighted that when she was auditing and training at a certain program, she reviewed my documentation as a psychiatrist documentation she found reference to the pain ad score and she gave me such a wonderful compliment and that went a long way for me. People with mild to moderate dementia may very well be able to report whether or not they have pain, but any level of dementia, especially with more advanced dementia, behavior may really be the primary expression of pain identify and address all causes of pain because there are very routinely more than one. Prior treatments and its effectiveness helps in developing an individualized pain management regimen. And as I said, interdisciplinary approach is absolutely essential. This is what Tina Alonso left with us and all of the Comfort Matters team that came to us. Mary Beth, thank you, you including that came to us. And we are 
feeling really good about having a team approach to understanding and managing pain. Pain relief is not always complete absence of pain, but rather a level of comfort which enables restful sleep, permits normal or comfortable function, function and ability to participate in one's social function that is personally meaningful. That personally meaningful is an important point. And often what is personally meaningful is also include the family. What do they think? They are the loved ones who often speak and under, speak to the residents and understand residents much better than often we who come in for a shift, see the residents for a short period and go home. That round up all the common causes. These are the common causes which are so vastly prevalent in uh, people who have dementia, arthritis, dental problems, urinary tract infections, constipation, neuropathies, pressure ulcer, and depression. The pre presence of depression will often magnify the perception of pain. Consider the value of extensive medical workup against potential benefit uh, of what the pers person's advanced care directives are. Is it really worth it to do a massive amount of medical workup to go for a relatively small gain against what distress the resident may go through by being sent out to a laboratory or getting a major test and probably not gaining much more in the result? Acute versus chronic pain. Pain types often, this may not be so relevant, but for a general understanding of the types of pain, nociceptive pain includes somatic pain, which feels like aching, throbbing, and squeezing. Common examples, sprain and fractures. Visceral pain, which feels like cramping and squeezing. Examples, appendicitis or gallstones. Neuropathic pain, burning, tingling, numbness nerve pressure, nerve damage, vital infections, diabetes, and alcohol use. Characteristics, PQRST, very useful way of remembering of uh, pain characteristics, which actually helps in subsequent management of the pain. The rational use of medication is an essential tool in the management of pain. So we can theoretically Consider pain doesn't happen in people with dementia. And we did see in Tina Alonso's presentation that irrespective of level of dementia, resident people with dementia do maintain ability to convey pain if we only know how to hear them. Pain behaviors may be the main symptoms and this is really where the key is to how to interpret all of the behaviors that we see. And that's where we won't go through the details of the pain at scale, but this is really the tool that I have gotten very comfortable with for so many years and I carry it all along with me and I share it liberally with people. Although it is so easy to use, once you use it a few times, you just memorize it. Uh, WHO, ladder of uh, pain management. Step one, mild pain, one, two, three. What to use if you use the pain medications? Acetaminophen or aspirin or NSAIDs. Plus or minus, you may use adjuvants, which may be pain patches, steroids, antidepressants, anticonvulsants. Step three, moderate to severe pain. Acetaminophen or aspirin or ibuprofen plus combination of an opioid, plus or minus, use any adjuvants. Step three, severe pain. This is where we saw the resident that I described, 72 year old, who did not have a lot of language function, but who showed a lot of anguish. With, during Comfort Matters program, we started him on opioid. Lo and behold, much more comfortable, able to eat, allowed for care and sat for long periods in the day room 
seemingly looking on and enjoying presence of other people and who then was able to enjoy presence of his wife who came with such dedication every single day, seeing him more comfortable. His wife was so much happier and it seemed such wonderful feeling to everyone to see not one but two people being much more comfortable with the use of this WHO's stepwise pain management approach. These three are not water type compartments. So you may need to go back and forth and move back and forth in a way that makes clinical sense. Roots of administration, while oral medications we use all the time, we've gotten very comfortable. Uh, patches and topical ointments are very important, easily available over the counter options. I don't think we use them as much and as often as it is possible. Something to worth keep in mind. Intramuscular and intravenous, of course, in more advanced stages uh, are important routes of administration. And perhaps this is just my thought, what seems to be the most underutilized route and easily available is uh, rectal use of suppositories of pain medications because how often do we find in the nursing homes that residents just do not have the ability or wish to take anything by mouth? And yet they may be worthing in pain according to our pain ad. And this is one important route to keep in mind and use it. Some common types of pains, uh, musculoskeletal pain. Um, and this is where rather than going through the detail, I'll just name the types of pain, which are all common ones. Neuropathic pain is much more responsive to antidepressants, anticonvulsants before considering opioids, but steroids and NSAIDs are also useful. Bone pain, somebody has a fracture, uh, NSAIDs plus or minus maybe opioids. Schedule of analgesics, I cannot talk enough about this or linger on it this long enough. Um, an interesting thing that I heard about from Tina Alonso, she, while she also said, do not use PRN medications, it was a nice, her interpretation was very nice. She says PRN means patient received none. Very good idea to absolutely put people on regular schedule analgesic medications, especially with those who have dementia, much better long-term efficacy, ensuring that the medication is received and it works. Just quick review of medication classes and some examples. Commonest, acetaminophen, NSAID, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, celecoxib, opioids, whole list, the rest of them less commonly utilized, but definitely are all very much available, appropriate options given uh, appropriate patient selection as to who is appropriate for when and for what uh, duration. Some special consideration. Acetaminophen, hepatotoxicity with doses over four grams, something to be kept in mind. A lot of NSAIDs have uh, issues with CHF and renal insufficiency. Many of them also need GI prophylaxis with most of the agents. With opioids, constip constipation, nausea, sedation, respiratory depression, worth keeping in mind and managing them simultaneously while we're using the medications giving somebody opioid and not worry about constipation would really be an inappropriate way of using opioids. Fentanyl patch. Occasionally I have needed to discuss with a colleague that first opioid treatment may not be a fentanyl patch. It is medically unacceptable and it potentially dangerous. Um, tricyclic antidepressants come with their own bag of anticholinergic side effects, which include dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, blurry vision, muscle relaxants may cause drowsiness and dizziness. I think this is really the kind of 
core principles of it. For now, I will stop. Thank you for the attention and we'll wait for question and answers later. Thank you. So can I share screen yet or do I have to wait until it's given back? Julie. No, I can't. Anne, you're on mute. Dr. Amin, could you take your screen down? Just going to write Julie and Julie Ms. Saskia, yeah, she'll be right. She'll be good. Right Thank you. you. Okay. In the meantime, that was wonderful, Dr. Ramin. Thank you. So as soon as you unshare oh. your screen. Let me start by introducing you, Mary Beth. <laughs> this oh, okay. uh, Next presentation will be by Mary Beth Gallagher, who is a uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner with a doctorate in nursing. She's the director of dementia programs for Hospice of the Valley in Arizona. And she has uh, a long history of collaborating, working very carefully with the folks at uh, Beatitudes Campus and Comfort Matters. And here is Mary Beth. Yay, let's see if I can get, yes, yahoo. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. All right, let me pull this down. You can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, great. Well, hi, everybody. Um, as we know, the non-pharmacological management strategies are usually the first line of choice, right? Because we don't want polypharmacy in our folks if we can avoid it. That said, when it's necessary to use them, let's use them, let's get them scheduled. And so we see that the non-pharmacological approaches are generally used in combination with analgesics, right? And when it comes to the non-pharm approaches, the research that supports their use, there's been quite a few studies, but they're never really robust and they come out with these conclusive answers because one size doesn't fit all, you know? And so what I, as I move through this presentation, the invitation would be to reflect on your own experiences of pain, what works, what doesn't work. And even if you are taking two acetaminophen because you have pain, isn't it nice if you have a headache, if somebody also says, hey, can I darken the room? Can I quiet things down? Can I get you a cool compress? Those kind of things. And doesn't it help while the medicine, A, is kicking in, so to speak, but B, doesn't it have a synergistic effect? So that's where we're gonna be going with this conversation. I wanna start here. First, there's the actual sensation of physical pain, right? So think about any kind of pain that you've had. All right, there's that physical sensation, you notice it, and then our minds start to do things, right? Our minds start to react once we've noticed the pain. So you notice that there are these reactions to pain. So A, physical sensation, then B, our reaction. And what are those reactions? Possibly like this. Usually it's not, oh good, I have some pain. So here's the question. Well, actually, let's look at some very common human reactions, okay? One is when we sense the pain, we can go, oh, gee, this is gonna be a horrible day, right? Have you ever done that? Or maybe it's like this, oh boy, nobody better mess with me today. You better all be careful. Or maybe it's something like, oh no, the pain is bad now and what if it's gonna get worse? And if you're like me on a really bad day, you can start to catastrophize and go, what if it's a tumor? And meanwhile, it's just like a little tension headache. And then for a lot of us, we, we immediately react by, react by saying, oh, just make the world go away, right? And so hopefully you can relate to these. So the point is, there's this physical sensation of pain and immediately afterwards, there are these human reactions that we have. And how do these reactions influence 
the actual perception of pain. Does it make it better? Probably not. Is it exactly the same? Maybe. Is it worse? Commonly it is. So the point here is that our reactions play a powerful role in our experience of pain. Pain can be perceived as less when we feel safe, when we feel relaxed, when we feel cared for and, and we say to somebody, oh, I've got this headache. And somebody goes, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. When we're connected with pleasure, when we're connected with soothing experiences, can it just help lessen that pain? And that's what the research tells us. We also know that pain can intensify when we have other feelings, when we're overstimulated. Think about how all the noise around you and you just want things to calm down. Or when we feel fearful, sometimes when we know we're gonna get an injection, it almost, our arm, it almost tightens up and stuff and can make the pain worse. When we're anxious, when we're angry, right? That contraction that can happen when we're lonely. Think about when you've had pain, when you've felt lonely and sad as compared to when you've had physical pain and you're in love and still feeling kind of bulletproof about the whole thing. So our reactions have a, a powerful effect. And so let's think about our residence as it pertains to this. When we experience more positive feelings, we help to loosen pain's grip, right? So think of our residents, we're giving them, we, we notice the pain, that they're having pain in this moment. Maybe if they have PRN pain medication, we're offering that to them. But while that medicine is kicking in, and, and also just because there's always more that we can do, how can we improve things? And I think we've all seen the Godfather movie, right? So in the Godfather, he says, I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. And there are offers that we can make to the brain, that we can make to people's feelings that they can't refuse. So here's my, here's my motto. I've been saying it since I started in this business and I'll say it because I'm from Brooklyn in a good Brooklyn accent. Make the brain a better offer, okay? <laughs> so make the brain an offer it can't refuse. Our brains, our minds are set up that they constantly are pursuing ways to make us feel better. So an example is um, if you taste something that's delicious, your brain goes, mmm, and then you know what your brain does next? More, more please, give me more. And it always tries to pursue the things we love and things we don't love that are unpleasant for us, our brain's always trying to squirm away from it, right? Mm. I don't want to do that. Or our brain will go, think happy thoughts, get away from this. So we're always trying to resist unpleasant experiences. So since this is the natural way of the mind, why don't we make the brain a better offer for our residents? So how do we do that using non-pharmacological approaches? That's gonna be our discussion, but first and foremost, we have to remember that one size doesn't fit all. One person's musical heaven is another person's musical hell, possibly, right? So it's got to fit the person's preferences. And then what we need to do is we need to modify certain things. First and foremost, our presence. We have to be mindful of what we feel like when we're in, the, in front of this person, right? We have to be accountable for the energy that we're bringing into any room. That's on us. And for some people, when they're hurting, we need to get soft and move even more slowly, right? Maybe we even need to give them more distance. Other people, they respond well to being a little bit more robust and, hey, I'm going to help you here. We're going to, right? So we have to be careful of our own presence, our therapeutic presence. Next, the environment. You know that there are certain people who really need, all of a sudden, they need dark, they need cool, they need quiet. Other people, not so much. They'll feel better in the company of someone else or holding something, maybe even a baby doll that they perceive as a real infant. So the infant, the modification of the environment is gonna be really important. How do we get rid of irritants? And how do we add those things that are pleasurably distracting and that are soothing? And then we're gonna talk about multiple senses and engagement activities. How do I engage you in something that's effortless for me to engage in and that can help distract me from this pain? So. First things first, the simple things. No matter what wonderful things you're gonna do for me, please take care of my basic body's needs. 
because no matter what kind of pain medicine you give me and no matter what kind of non-form stuff you're going to do, if I'm hot or cold or hungry or thirsty or tired or I need to move my bowels or bladder or get taken out of the soil brief, if I need to stretch, if I need to be repositioned, all of that stuff needs to be handled. And I know it's common sense and pretty much everything I'm going to say to you, you already know. But I think what I'm going to be able to do is take it from the back of your mind, what you already know, and bring it to the front and go, oh, yeah, we can do this, too. And you know what? It may seem like a little thing, but when it's you, it's not a little thing. It's a big deal. So now we're going to be talking about sensory experiences. But first, I want to just say that we know, especially in advanced dementia, that as the disease like Alzheimer's moves through the brain, it impairs more and more parts of the brain, right? So my thinking, my reasoning, my language. At the middle part of the brain where the limbic system is, which processes emotions, boy, my feeler, my thinker may not be working, but my feeler is still working. And you can see that in all of your residents with dementia. So since the feeler's working, I'm gonna concentrate on that area. And I'm going to try to create pleasant feelings. And one of the easiest ways to change feelings to talk to the limbic system is through the five senses or however many of the senses the person has left. So let's start off with sight. The first way that generally as human beings take in information is through the eyes. So think about this. I want you to go here in your mind, okay? Really kind of fall into this picture. Now, what does it sound like when you're there? What does it smell like? What is the temperature on your skin? Okay, so I'm going to stop right there for the sake of time. But isn't it interesting that you're sitting wherever it is that you're sitting? And yet when you look into this and I ask you these questions, you can almost feel it or hear it or smell it. There's this amazing part of our brain that can take us to other places pretty effortlessly. So isn't that beautiful for someone who's perhaps in a nursing home saying, I wanna go home, I wanna go home. And they live in the nursing home, but what they're talking about is a place that was 40 years ago. On your smartphone or on any kind of device or even a calendar, you can pull up pictures and you can show the pictures to the person and share those moments with them and maybe ask them those questions that I asked you. But if they don't have ability to answer questions, you can create a reverie almost like a guided imagery. So instead I'd go, that looks like the perfect day. I bet the air is warm, but that's just enough of a breeze that we stay cool. I can smell the salt in the air and it can take the person there. So just one idea for visual. And there's so many different things we can look at, right? Including out the window. Okay, sound is the second way that usually we take in information. Um, think about how sounds influence you. They can lift you up, they can drag you down, they can suck the energy right out of you. Just a couple of notes from your favorite song. As soon as you hear just a couple of notes, you can get goosebumps, your eyes can well up with tears. That's amazing considering the neurochemical cascade that takes place so instantly just because of a sound. If that was a medication, wow, that would be really expensive, right? Working more quickly than IV push medication. So particularly, I bet everybody who's listening here is familiar with music, the value of individualized music for people with dementia and how some of the last process, parts of the brain to deteriorate are parts that process music. So there's a tremendous amount of potential here. Again, it's got to be customized, but also think about other sounds. Let's say I know that what would be best is to help you relax. Now, maybe because you have advanced dementia, I can't use breathing techniques for you because maybe you're not going to be able to follow that. But what if I put on the sounds of ocean waves coming in, going out? That sound, even just on the outside of our body, our body tends to synchronize. There's a word called entrainment, where the body, the muscles start to relax, the breathing changes. For me, listening to birds singing, 
are is is incredibly therapeutic. So there's any number of sounds that you could use for people. And again, with our smartphones, we have a lot of access that now that we didn't then. Touch. Let's think about touch. We know that people with advanced dementia receive a lot of custodial touch, don't they? We clean them, we clean their brief, we provide all that personal care. Okay, so there's that touch. But then there's the touch that makes the difference in our lives, that human touch that keeps us from going into failure to thrive, right? So, you know, we say that dementia is high, dementia care is high touch, low tech, right? So are we really using that? Now, touch really varies from person to person, right? Some people are, do not touch me, don't hug me, not a hugger. I'm a hospice person. We're huggers. So can that help? Also, massage, when we talk about sore joints, et cetera, perhaps a nice massage over those muscles, or maybe simply a very brief hand massage. I know lots of people don't have time necessarily for a lot of hands-on care, but a real quick hand massage can make a big difference. Have you ever had the experience in your life with a squeeze of a hand from someone else has said so much more than words ever could? And so maybe just holding hands to say, we're connected, you're not alone. Rocking. Now there's rocking that's an agitated kind of rocking, but then there's a rocking that's very, very soothing to human beings. Why do, here's the evidence, why do we rock babies, right? What is that doing? Instinctively, we know about this. So maybe helping a person rock, that movement, that rhythmic movement could help provide some comfort. Then as far as also touch, you know, let's think about, um, I love the rice bags or the flax bags, whatever you have that we can put in a microwave. And so many times, even just handing little ones and putting them in the palms of people's hands seem to provide comfort. Then there is also cold applications or even a cool compress to a head of someone who has a fever or who has a headache. Textures can be very, very comforting. Fleece is not exactly, exactly a fashion forward material, is it? But it sure feels good when we want comfort and when we want to feel warm. Also, it's kind of been interesting. They've been doing some studies with pieces of fur well, from like old mink coats and stuff and putting it on a person's lap and letting them stroke it and that it can be comforting. Let us never forget the fit of clothing. I think some of us, when we get home from work, we take off our shoes and some of the women take off their bras just between us, right? Because it just makes us feel more comfortable. Holding something, isn't it interesting how, um, you know, the, like both of these pictures, Margaret's holding a baby doll that she perceives to be a real baby. And so when she does that, there's oxytocin flowing through her system. It's making her feel better. And, and then holding a pet, we use a lot of mechanical pets at Hospice of the Valley for those individuals who see that they're, who believe that they're real. So therefore, same kind of neurochemistry is gonna be coursing through the body, giving them comfort. And then any one of us who has ever been a patient who has been offered a warm blanket and said, yes, please, when that blanket is put on us, our whole selves goes, It's far beyond the warm blanket. So if you have a blanket warmer, well, fancy you. But if you have a clothes dryer, we can do that in other ways. Let us never underestimate what that warm blanket, how it just goes body, mind, and spirit. <sighs> Smells. Now, not everybody who has dementia can smell. But for those who can, let's think of the ramifications. If we have any coffee drinkers out there, I think one of my most sacred moments in the morning is a fresh brewed cup of coffee and I go. And in that moment, I'm like, man, this is living. And it's such a small thing. And yet it starts off the day in such a different way if I don't have that. So think about smells, right? The first olfactory nerve, and you know where it goes, where it sends the signal first and foremost, not to the thinking part of the brain, but it goes right to the limbic system. So smells change the way we feel before they even change the way we think. So when we walk into places and there's smells, boom, we're already having an emotional reaction, whether aware of it or not. 
So why not use these in order to enhance a pleasurable or soothing experience of someone who's having pain? So what would that be? Well, it depends on the person, right? Think about, um, of course, florals can be pleasant, certain foods, again, a, a cup of tea, a warm cup of tea or coffee. But also we think about aromatherapy. There are certain essential oils that are associated with soothing and helping people feel less pain and lavender happens to be one of them. But also if a person's been a cook or they have cultural background, think about the smells that are associated with where they're from, the beach, the pines, New York City. Okay, that's an interesting smell. <laughs> But you know, you know what I'm saying here, but also if you're a baker, uh, think about cinnamon, vanilla, or any of your ethnic backgrounds and the spices that they cook with, right? Yeah. Well, think about right now. So we're in the fall. If you go into a lot, if, when you go to certain places, I know we're not getting out much, but if you were, you know, we'd start to smell pumpkin and spice and all those kind of fall candles. So, so many possibilities here. Now, my favorite of the senses, who here has ever put a piece of food in their mouth to make themselves feel better? I've actually been talking and wanted to share this with you. Okay, that's Maybe interesting. 10 minutes from here. Could somebody uh, put their- the snow, yeah, keep the house. And in the snow. Grandpa? So, am I having audio hallucinations or the rest of you? No, somebody has their, uh, doesn't have their mute on. Thank you. Michael's iPad and uh, Levy EVM. You put your mute on, thank you. Thank you. All right, so back to food. Who here has ever put a piece of food in their mouth to make themselves feel better? I would imagine that you're all saying, oh yeah, uh-huh. All right, so listen. How's the first way that um, infants are learn how to self-soothe? Putting their thumb in their mouth and sucking on their thumb, right? So oral stimulation is very self-soothing and for most of us until our dying days may well be a primary way of self-soothing. So then when we think about this, what, what kinds of food? Well, for different people, it's different. If you grew up in New York City, I'm thinking that when you don't feel well, if somebody offers you a bowl of chicken noodle soup, it could help, or at the very least, as we say in Brooklyn, it wouldn't hurt, right? So, but also for many of the time, it's soft and sweet. And one of the reasons why soft and sweet works is sweet contains sugar. And when sugar gets in our system, it signals the release of dopamine in the reward settings and centers of our brain. So we think about all sorts of sweet foods, but again, it can be anything. It could be the food that your mom used to make when you just were feeling kind of down. It could be toast with butter or brown sugar and cinnamon, a cup of tea, whatever it is. So many different things. Let's remember that food is so much more than nutrition. Food is a powerful medicine that can comfort us. I have these lollipops up there because I, I don't know if you're aware of these. We have a place called Seas Candy and they make these toffee lollipops. The reason why I put them up there is Lots of lollipops, if you bite down on them, they can break up into a whole bunch of pieces, right? And then the person could choke. These toffee ones, you can't, you can't break them. And so you keep licking them and it takes about 15, 20 minutes of licking for them to disappear. And so even if I don't have good memory um, because my brain likes sugar, I see this thing in my hand. So I go, oh yeah, and I might put it down, but oh yeah. And so I keep doing this and we've had people who have been very uncomfortable and while their medication was taking effect, we were able to give this them and it was the oral stimulation of the sugar, but the self-soothing of the oral stimulation really provided some comfort. My patients have been my greatest teachers. I've learned so much from them. And one of them is about the power of spiritual practices. And it can be anything from putting on hymns in the background, any kind of spiritual practices, any prayers that are particular to an individual. I know that sometimes I've even taken a person's old leather Bible and put it on their lap and just their hand feeling the Bible and the little tiny pages 
it's just soothing for them. And maybe starting with the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. A prayer shawl. Um, what have I learned from farmers? That one of their deepest spiritual experiences is got to get them out of the unit, got to get them into the sun, take their shoes off, put their tootsies in the grass, let them feel the sun on their face, the wind, let them hear the birds. And that really speaks to their spirit. And I come from Catholicism, and I know that many a time just putting ro rosary beads in somebody's hands and maybe helping them make the sign of the cross and saying the first prayer just has this, um, this automatic conditioned response, if you will, that brings people comfort and strength. And then for many of us, we can come from spiritual practices that suffering is a part of the spiritual practice that we can then offer up for others. And it gives meaning and purpose to our suffering. So for some, this is pretty powerful just to be able to say, I see that you're uncomfortable. Maybe we can offer this up. Because I know that in hospice, one of the things I've learned that's really important is that until people are truly in the hours of their last death, reciprocity with the world around them and having a sense of meaning and purpose in life is essential. So let us not forget pleasurable engagement. If there's any artistic expression that you can use, again, if you can get any pets, please, if we can get them dancing to some music that definitely lightens our load or some stretching or some yoga, guided imagery, like I did showed you the picture and you can create this reverie. Deep breathing is great if you can just model it in front of the person and see if you can help so that you can turn off the sympathetic nervous reaction to the pain and instead activate the power sympathetic nervous system, the tendon by befriend, the rest and digest part of our nervous system. So I want to end by saying um, what we've learned with Miss Catherine. So Miss Catherine had advanced dementia. She had a severe aphasia, um, very limited mobility to begin with. Unfortunately, she had a fall which resulted in bilateral hip fractures and she became completely bed bound. And you know how devastating this is when a resident on the unit falls and it kind of breaks everybody's heart. She was enrolled in hospice. She was prescribed round the clock analgesics, right? Because we want to maximize her comfort. But her caregivers all were saying, you know, is there anything more that we can do to maximize her comfort and to her quality of life? Because she's just staring up at the ceiling and this seems like a sad end to her story. So the staff brainstormed and thinking about the senses and customizing it to what we knew that Miss Catherine enjoyed. For sight, a butter, um, butterfly mobile was put over the top of her bed. So although she couldn't move much and she was just looking up, she would notice these butterflies kind of dangling over here, which would make her laugh. Also, somebody brilliantly came up with the idea of getting a projector. Okay, this is pretty high tech stuff. And they projected it on the ceiling and they at times showed pictures of her favorite flowers, just so that she could delight on the visual stimulus coming in. Then they put, um, we had a CD player and we played her favorite music. And even though she was this little old cute little church lady, actually one of her favorite songs was Born to be Wild, which was pretty funny. Um, touch, she loved hand massages. And remember that's kind of reflexology. And so we'd massage her hands with lavender scented lotion, trying to soothe her. Her swallowing was pretty darn bad, but she loved chocolate. And so we would put Hershey's chocolate kisses in her mouth and she would melt and enjoy it. And anything that she couldn't tolerate and swallow, we'd just turn her head and take the rest of it out. But like, we really were trying to maximize her enjoyment. Lastly, her spiritual practices, we would say, Miss Catherine, may we say the Lord's Prayer with you because we know it's one of your favorite song um, prayers. And so we would say that slowly with her and we could see her mouth from time to time mouthing the words, even though she had difficulty speaking. So all of that is to say, there's always something we can do. Pills, thank God for medications, right? But there's more, let's create this synergistic effect the research suggests that when we're using non-pharmacological approaches, try to use at least two of them, right? So one is good, but two or more is, is, is even better because again, it's influencing our feeling, which is definitely going to have a powerful effect on our experience of the pain. So in conclusion, as we use it, you got to customize it to the individual, right?
You got to trial it, see if it works. You got to evaluate, right? Is it effective? And keep modifying it until you've found the right recipe for this individual. So I hope that that's been helpful. And thank you for your time and attention. Oh, Mary Beth, uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I swear, the two of you are just the perfect combination and we really, we can't thank you enough. That was terrific. We do have a couple of questions and we have room for more if anybody wants to um, add anything on the chat room. Actually, one question was not a question. It was just that she determined after listening to you, Dr. Amin, that yeah, she needs more chocolate. <laughs> um, <laughs> One question that came up and is certainly, I'm sure, on, on people's minds uh, related to infection control. Uh, and this question is for you, Mary Beth, uh, the idea of uh, how do you handle infection control when you're using mechanical pets? Yeah, I, I know. So um, it's been expensive. So we have these cleaners that come with those mechanical pets. Um, and you can, so first of all, you would clean the person's hands right before they get anywhere near it and then um, we have these pets but you know what we've been doing for the most part is actually trying to keep one pet per person at this time yeah that makes sense I think that's it's really expensive but yeah so on medications yes yes <laughs> and comfort is hard to come by in these days so if something works this is by all means the time to do it if at all possible. Um, any other questions from anybody? Well, if not, um, I want to once again say thank you. I thought this was, uh, you know, completely fabulous, and we've gotten some very nice comments on the on the chat page. Um, next, in two, we we will not be doing this again uh, next week. It's going to be two weeks for our last session which will be looking at pain and dementia in the context of health disparities and cultural competence. Um, so that will be on Tuesday the 10th, uh, once again from one to two. Uh, Nikki Mariano and uh, Paula Rock Price from um, uh, our Caring Kind will be um, addressing this. They are uh, very involved in all the activities at uh, Caring Kind and have had a lot of experience in these areas. Um, and, you know, we just want to emphasize that these are all ideas for you to try. You've all, I'm sure everybody on this call or on, a, on this series has tried different pieces of these, but sometimes, um, as Mary Beth said, we kind of tend to put them on the back burner or maybe um, on another level, we don't always think they're that important. But I think if anything uh, that we've been taught or reminded of over these last several months is that little things do mean a lot and that's as true for the person with dementia as it is for anyone else. So I really encourage you all to um, uh, take these the messages we heard today to heart. Um, you are welcome to be in touch with us if you have further questions. As we've said in the past, we are preparing our, um, our simple two-page newsletter. We'll be doing one for each of these sessions so that you can have some of these points reinforced and be able to share them. And we also are recording all these sessions so they will be available on our website. So you're welcome to share them around and we'll be very happy to have you do so. Um, and somebody just asked about access at a later date and uh, that she'd love her family to hear. So that's really a great, great thing to hear. And we will be, they are recorded. We will be putting them on the website. And actually, since we know how to contact everybody who sign up, we'll let you know when that happens so that you can have uh, easy access. And with that, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Ravi. We're, we're deeply, deeply grateful, as we always are, because you always come through for us so beautifully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Virtual hugs. <laughs>